さ。There we go. All right. So, what we're going to do today is a little different than how Robert teaches. I'm going to tell you more of a story, and we're going to hit four sites, but we're not going to do them separately. They're going to be integrated in a sort of more world system approach, and we're going to move around back and forth as we move through the various scales. So, I drew this diagram of the architecture of the slave economy. Rather than focus on single buildings, we're going to focus more on systems that are expressed through architecture from the detail level up to a global scale of trade. Okay? So a couple of misconceptions about the Americas. There's a myth in the way we teach United States history that the Europeans arrived in the wilderness. That is false. There were basically 80 to 100 million people inhabiting the Americas. Um, they were mostly settled. Farmers and traders, for the most part, they didn't become mostly nomadic until they were driven to that once horses and guns were introduced and they were pushed off the coast. The decimation of the population is largely blamed on disease, but that is also inaccurate. That yes, they had a disease immunity, but they were also captured as slaves before they could bear children. They were murdered if they did not convert to Christianity in their winter stores, which kept them alive and had been very sophisticated were disintegrated as were their fields, so they starved to death. And this is one of the largest genocides in the history of humanity, is 80% of the indigenous population dies when the first hundred years of contact. Now, Europeans have been approaching North America since the Vikings, uh, Hudson, of course, in, but it's in the 15th century, end of the 15th century through the 16th century that we get Columbus, we get Vasto da Gama, who will sort of hit Indian Ocean, which we'll talk about tomorrow or the next lecture. But most important for our purposes is we're going to start with Spain. Now, I'm going to do a little preview of what you're going to cover in the next lecture, so to highlight this. The difference between the slave economy and some of the other lectures is it spans a wide range of time, almost 300 years, 400 years, and arguably still present in the world today. When Columbus sets off for Spain after eight years of trying, he has, like many Europeans, forgotten the math that the Arabs and the Greeks knew who precisely predicted the length of the world. And he was looking for China. Vasco da Gama and the Portuguese had already reached India in 1480. And they had found the spices. And by 1570, Portugal will control most of the spice trade on their way to China. Because they thought China was a lot closer, they assumed that they could get there very quickly. And when they ran into what he, well, today, Haiti, what they called Hispaniola, they assumed that they were in India, largely because they found cotton. And cotton at this time, fine cottons, only came from India, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, and most of them, including the original settlers at Jamestown, assumed that they were about 100 miles from the Pacific Ocean. Because they were going to look for gold, get back in their boats, and go. But there was a number of sort of things that carried with them. One, looking for gold. Two, looking for slaves, and C, looking for souls to convert. Christopher Columbus named himself Christopher, and I am the Christ bearer. And he believed that his job was to convert, and the Portuguese have a similar issue when they go to India and Brazil. But it's also important to remember this is the very moment when Europe evicts all of its non-Christians, 1492. It's not just the moment he sails the ocean blue, as we learn in elementary school, this is the moment the Sephardim are created, they're evicted, and the, uh, an irony from today, they were welcomed into the Ottoman Caliphate. And many Jews and Muslims smuggled themselves aboard ships as Christians to come to the Americas. And as you're going to learn in the next lecture, much of the Spanish style is a hybrid version of colonialism, Mujadar architecture, and native indigenous uh, techniques. And so when he comes... He sort of, all Europeans are stunned when they first arrive, the first generation, because they're tall, they're healthy, um, they seem to be nice. They ha and of course, as Christians, they have no religion. And he says, with 50 men, I could govern them as they please. Now, when this message gets back to Europe, of course, any second son who's not going to inherit land is, gets on a boat to create his own fortune. He originally, actually, his first mission actually doesn't quite make it. He grounds himself on a tiny shoal, lost, loses one of his boats, goes back, 
comes back with a much bigger fleet and more men, comes back again, then dies, and then his brothers and cousin or son take over, and then it is an onslaught. And you'll talk more about this later. And so basically they're coming to sort of convert them to European ways and convert them to souls, but mostly they're looking for gold. And so in your next lecture, you're going to sort of talk more about this. It's important to remember at this time, the Aztec Empire has already colonized most of this. The Aztec Empire, the Incas are sort of contemporary with Rome of this period. But the European view of the world is very narrow. Again, they only see what they've discovered. And so what they believe is that they're close to China. Remember, China and India are the source of wealth of all the world at, for most of human history. Um, and because pepper, by the time it gets to, and other things, by the time it gets to Europe in an age without refrigeration, is so valuable, it's worth more than its weight, it's gold. So it's worth the risk to send a ship out into the ocean by this point to try and find a new path. As I mentioned, when the Spanish arrived, they immediately set out colonizing the edges of the coast. They called this place New Andalusia. Andalusia is the name of Spain under the, under the Moors or the... Uh, westernmost caliphate, and they believe this is a new world. La Florida, New Andalusia, and they begin to send out exploration looking for the lost city of gold. Now, this Cortez finds gold. Portuguese finds gold. There is no gold in North America, not yet. And they set out to colonize. Now, the Timucua convert. They are largely spared. The Gual fail, and they are largely massacred. And so when Oglethorpe arrives, in Georgia to found Savannah in 1733, it's largely depopulated. But what they're also looking for are slaves, because by this point they have found gold in the rivers of Hispaniola, and they need slaves to mine them. So the first slaves in the Americas are the indigenous population themselves. And there are diaries of uh, early sailors in the 15, early 1500s going up and capturing as many able-bodied men as they possibly can off an island, depopulating entire tribes, taking all the men and children, shoving them on their boat, and bringing them back. So the first instance of slavery is this. The second issue, and this is what the issue with the Anthropocene is, is that there is a massive exchange of materials around the world. What is the key ingredient in Italian food, aside from pasta? It's red. Tomatoes. Tomatoes are indigenous to Peru. They're all poisonous except for one that was domesticated in Mexico. There is no such thing as tomato sauce in Italy until after this period. Potatoes, indigenous Peru. There's no potatoes in Ireland until after this period. There are over 20,000 varieties. Cotton is indigenous to most of the world. There's no such thing as corn, no such thing as beans. In the rest of the world's diet until after this period. Right. This is when goods that have been largely trapped around the world. There's no such thing as coffee here. Coffee comes from here. Tea. There's no such thing as tea in England until they discover it in China. So all these traditions that we associate with various cultures now are a product of the post-Columbian exchange. So let's go back to Portugal. For most of half a millennia, Spain is actually controlled by a rebel caliphate uh, opposed to Damascus and the emergence of the Ottoman Empire. The Christian Reconquista begins in the north and slowly divides into kingdoms. The first major city to be liberated or taken, depending on your point of view, from the Muslims is Lisbon, known as Lisboa, which just happens, he's laying siege to it when a cr crusader fleet just happens to be sailing by. The king of, of, well, who becomes the king of Portugal says, hey, you can all go. The crusader fleet says no, and they sack and murder everybody. And then they continue on their way. And so what happens is this is an on and off process. It goes back and forth, back and forth. In many cases, very conservative Berber tribes come to help the Christians depose what they see as decadent caliphates. Cities are burned and built over and over again. While what will become Spain is still fighting, Portugal doesn't end around. 1413, reverses the conquest that started in Morocco and came across Gibraltar and conquers the city of Queda. And from here, they will slowly begin to move around the trading zone of Africa. Now, again, this is a preview of what you're going to be coming across in a few weeks. This is a pretty sophisticated system of kingdoms 
Gold is largely found here and here. Gold in the Muslim trading world that goes to purchase spices crosses this way and then enters the Indian Ocean. The Americas will change that math. So the original European colonization only colonizes the edges until the 19th century. You guys talked about this at the Berlin Conference. And the Portuguese begin to establish little trading ports designed to protect their fleet, not from the natives, but from other competitors. At this time, Spain, later France, later the English and the Dutch. An example of this is Gore off the coast of Senegal. It's a tiny little island, just enough to resupply, protected by a fort. Wow, that's a really low resolution image. Hopefully this one's better. There we go. With enough stuff, sort of like Batavia or Cape Town, to sort of refuel a fleet and a church. As they move around, they get to the coast of what is now Ghana, Nigeria, the Gold Coast, because this is where the gold is supposed to be. And they set up trading with the local tribe. Uh, there's actually a kingdom just above here, anchored around Timbuktu, and they begin to trade for gold. They build their first fort. Oh, that's not showing up. There we go. And you can see how the Europeans interpret this. This is where you get ivory, this is where you get gold, this is where you get slaves. Right? What they're looking for is a sort of extractive mercantilism, which you sort of were introduced to last time. Right? They're looking for commodities and stuff. Portuguese and Spanish are looking for gold and silver. The advantage of the English and the Dutch is they're looking for anything that is of value, and you end up with the silver anyway. So here we could see the sort of idea that this is sort of uh, a place where Europeans can penetrate and get their things, and this is that. It is important to understand today that the divide between rural Islam and urban Christianity in Nigeria is along this line. Right? The current wars are still in these places that have been Christianized or Islamized a long time before. And the barriers between the more urban, invested European colonial spaces and the rural, non-colonial spaces pre-19th century are still fighting that war. They build a fort with imported material. It's large, probably the first um, prefab fort. They load stones onto a giant fleet. They build Fort Elmina. Elmina means the mine. So originally, this is for gold. Pre-cut, massive ships. What will eventually happen, however, is this is designed originally to harvest gold coming out of this trading network. And what the Europeans do is they reverse a trading network that went from west to east to the west coast as now the ships begin to take it elsewhere. So the trading note goes in reverse. And there's a lot of uh, study on how these towns adjust to a new flow going in both directions. So the Prezos economy of the Portuguese, and you're going to talk about this a little in your next lecture, basically establishes a series of outposts that can protect their fleet on the long two-year round trip journey into the Indian Ocean, to protect them back and forth to Lisbon, to do an end around of this ancient network that will survive till about the 15th century, where spices, cotton, silk, pepper all go this way, gold comes this way, and then what the Portuguese will do is break this loop, and then you already saw this with the Dutch and the English by going around. So at the period we're going to talk about this is sort of the vast trading network of the world, where the ocean is now taken over. In night, just after Columbus, as Portugal has, Vasco da Gama has always already sacked Western India, the Spanish and the Portuguese draw a line to divide the world in half, all looking for China, called the Treaty of Tordesillas. Portugal gets this part, Spain gets that part, and again, as you'll learn tomorrow, Acapulco is precisely designed to get the gold out of their mines to China. So the treaty divides the world. Now keep in mind, this is right before the Dutch and the English come into play. And what you see is it creates up a system whereby land is cut straight in on a grid from the coast to that borderline. And this borderline will be fought tremendously. So what happens is Brazil is first encountered by uh, the navigator of Columbus and then is immediately followed by Portuguese who claims that it's the land of the true cross for 
King Manuel of Portugal, and here you can see the division of land divided by the captains of the ships. So this is a quick, amazing get-rich scheme. Then Amerigo Vespucci follows, lands in the Bahia del Todos, because it's called, he lands there on All Saints Day, then discovers Rio, naming it Rio de Janeiro, the river of January. The original capital of Brazil will be Salvador, because it's the first established, and Rio will be a relatively small town. So again, the European view of the world is what they've encountered. They believe China is just the other side of the Americas. For them, Malacca, which you learned, did you learn about that the last time or is it next time? We mentioned Malacca. Is looms huge. This is a time, this is where Singapore is today. Because of the monsoon, it is immensely difficult to get around this peninsula. So you have to stay here. So even though it's tiny on the real world map, it is the biggest thing on earth because it is such a they take, you have to wait for the winds to change. So everybody has to wait here for a year. And you can see that again on this map. But what's also important on this map is this is where we get the word America, where this cosmographer names it after Amerigo, somewhere down here in Central America. So we're not named after Columbus. At this time, looming large on this map are the two discoverers of Columbus and Amerigo Vespucci, despite the fact that other people have been here before. So this brings us to the core of our argument. While looking for gold, they intend to create an indigenous slave population. The decimation of the population leaves them without cheap labor. Slavery has always existed in humankind, usually in small bunches, usually captured war. There's been a slave trade going on forever. What colonialism introduces is mass slave population, relocation of millions of people from one continent to another. For the depopulation of the indigenous population, they need cheap or free forced labor to operate their mines and eventually the productive plantations to produce global commodities for desire. And basically this is African on African violence, tribes, Muslim tribes from the north, wealthy tribes from the coast. Who are, now, who are jealous of the interior kingdoms, who had been powerful, now get power. They get guns from the Europeans, and they start to raid. They, attack, they march them back to the coast. They put them in cages. And now they're doing it in mass. And they deliver them to the ports. Now these ports had always been valuable as trading ports, but now that they are attached to a much more valuable commodity than gold, which is humans, this becomes a massive war. Elmina changes hands a number of times. And as the Dutch and the English rise in the 17th century, they depose the Portuguese out of every part of Africa except for Angola, which they will rule till 1979. It's important to remember colonialism is a recent phenomenon and an ancient phenomenon. The Portuguese will not leave Angola until 1979. And they will be fought by the apartheid government, tries to keep Portugal there. The US will try to keep Portugal there. Goa doesn't leave Portugal's hands till 1961. So this is a 400 year legacy. Now this is a giant trading port, not designed to extract gold, but to funnel slaves. The fort is modified to hold its cargo. This is the slave hold where you were dropped into a hole and kept there until a ship comes. This is what's known as the door of last return. You have been with your family, Five days later, you walk out that door, you never see home again. You are dropped into the hold of a cargo and you are stacked like lumber. This is about efficiency. You don't need room for food, you don't need room for water, you only want the strong to survive because the strong are worth more money. You stack them like lumber. The attrition naturally gives you better people that you can sell for higher costs. So ships that were designed to hold massive amounts of goods for ballast and speed and defense now are redesigned for the purpose of carrying slaves. And so ships are redesigned. You can see maps on how to best stack them full of the most value. And then you use the trade winds to create what we call the triangle trade, which is not accurate accurate. Trade winds facilitate. You come from Europe, you pick up human beings, you redistribute the human beings in the Americas, then you take the trade winds back with the raw resources you found, gold, cotton, timber, to Europe, then you pick up manufacturing goods and you redistribute them throughout the world. 
Colonialism is extractive. And many of those goods include this, lumber. Lumber is very important. It allows you to build ships. So most of the British, French, Dutch, Portuguese fleet is made out of lumber coming out of the Americas. You turn, you sell, send cotton to England, which we'll get to, and they return t-shirts. This involves everybody. Here is a ship docking of a San Dominique, modern day Haiti and Dominican. That it was from Nantes, France, had just gone to Angola, and was now dropping off slaves to uh, probably harvest sugar. And then in return, they pick up a cask of processor sugar, which would be rum. So it is a global factory system. Here's another example, carrying slaves and gold and pepper, which came from Asia and had been dropped off. Heads to Barbados, drops off the slaves, goes there, picks up molasses, sugar, and then heads to Liverpool to be used to Liverpool, then comes back with iron, and then does the whole circuit again. A global exchange. Most of the slaves that come across go to the Caribbean to harvest sugar and to Brazil. Now, we're more familiar with that of the American South, and we'll get to that in a second. But let's go to Brazil for a second. Angola, because once Portuguese lose access to this, although it will take slaves forever, they begin to sort of extract them primarily from Angola and into Brazil for a number of reasons. After 1570, their control of the spice trade peaks. It starts to go into the hands of the English and the Dutch in 1600, 1602. And they begin, but luckily, just after this period, they discover gold in Brazil. And they have a voracious appetite for slaves. Here are slaves that have arrived sick. They're getting sorted in Rio de Janeiro. Rio de Janeiro, like Charleston's primary purpose, was to import human cargo. That's how it starts. Here's a slave market. Here's another one. Now, slaves have multiple purposes. We tend to think them in the fields picking cotton. They were sold in groups. They were sold to households. You either you could treat them however you wanted. In many cases, they were household servants. They were attendants. They were punished like animals, which we'll get to in a minute. They were sorted by type. Certain, there were, became a reputation, certain slaves from certain parts of Africa are better for certain tasks. In the muddy streets of Brazil, they were used for transportation. They were used to process indigo, so they were industrial workers. This is a story of a woman from England who visits and is talking about how the streets are so terrible, she had to hire slaves, which was very cheap to take her through, and they would keep the windows closed so she didn't have to look at the filth. The source of all of Brazil's and Portugal's early wealth, they finally strike gold, just like the Spanish, at a place called Minas Gerais, the mine. Minas Gerais will be a wealth for Brazil on into the present. When the gold runs out, and you can see the spike here in slavery, they discover gold here. So most of the slaves heading to Brazil work the mines. Now, originally, they're indigenous. They're marched to the mines and part of the local population. Minas Gerais becomes one of the wealthiest cities in the world very, very rapidly. And it is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site with a number of really amazing little Baroque churches uh, by, in theory, a guy named Alandino. Uh, who was born in Lisbon uh, to a, uh, he's mulatto, he's both Portuguese and native Brazilian, uh, lost ability to use his hands, and so draw, drew with sticks tied to his wrist. Eventually the gold runs out, but by this time, Minas Gerais had such a hard time getting goods through the massive jungle up the river from Rio that they've created a very diversified economy. They had made coffee, they grew their own food, they had cattle, and so it was its own, and when gold disappears, starting in the early 17th century, they swiftly shift the slave production over to coffee. And they begin to import more females so that they can breed them. So you can see the slave population begins to decline when the gold runs out, and then as coffee takes over, it explodes. It is because of Minas Gerais that the capital is moved from Salvador to Rio de Janeiro, because that is a source of Brazil's wealth. 
And of course, now Brazil, of course, is one of the world's largest coffee producers, which we'll get to at the end of this class. This is coffee drying. Today, Minas Gerais is still very valuable, mostly for iron ore, still produces coffee, still produces gold and sugar. And this is what it looks like from space. And of course, its agriculture now looks like modern agriculture. So one of the ideas of this uh, class, and in general, is to understand that some of these systems persist into the present. You guys are going backwards. I usually go forward. The remains of the Rio has grown so fast that they just unearthed the remains of the Empress Wharf where the slaves were imported. Um, and they were originally going to bury it, but they decided to leave it as a sort of money. So these are the places that imported. These are all thousands. So four million to Brazil, nearly a million to Haiti and Jamaica, Cuba, where all the sugar was grown, and half a million to the Americas. Which brings, so now we're going to move to the more common sites in the American South, the plantation system. Charleston was the most important port except in the South for the England because of its imports for slaves. Indeed, when Savannah was founded in 1733, it was not founded as a going concern. It was founded merely to keep the Spanish away from Charleston. Keep in mind, there is a global war for resources. And so we have all these advertisements, right, to be sold. Men, women, children, highest price. Now, it's important to remember slaves were extraordinarily expensive, so only the wealthiest people could afford them. Usually, it was actually cheaper to get an indentured servant, but that was really hard. It was very expensive to get labor into the Americas, so you paid a lot, and then you could force them to work forever. This contradicts the myth of this sort of city on a hill, right? This sort of pilgrim myth that we've come to sort of establish religious freedom. Every group that comes from England is a charter company. They sign a contract with the king to return goods in exchange for their voyage. And they came to extract goods for the British. The plantation system was actually invented in their first colony in Ireland. Ireland was forested. And the first thing you do is you chop down the trees. A, to drive out the natives so they no longer have a place to hide. You use that lumber to build ships, houses, and sell for cordwood. Then you terraform the landscape to produce your most valued commodity, which at this time is wool, to feed their burgeoning textile industry. So what you see in Ireland today is a landscape created by the English to produce wool for their wool factories in, in Lancaster. Same thing begins to happen in the Americas, the cultivated landscape of the Native Americans, retreats, wilderness comes back briefly, and then it is immediately begins to terraform as trees are cut down to make space for all of these things. Now, one of the things that we don't learn about the Declaration of Independence, it wasn't really about taxation or freedom, it was that British colonists were not allowed to compete with Britain. You couldn't have an anvil bigger than this, you weren't allowed to make any sort of textiles because that was England's proprietary knowledge. You were only allowed to harvest raw goods, send them to England, and then you had to, you could harvest iron, send it to England, and then buy your hammer back from England. So the list of grievances doesn't just about taxes and tea, which incidentally was caused by a famine in Bengal, but that's a different story. It was about the fact that you were not allowed to manufacture. So the colonial economy is about extracting goods from the periphery, and sending them back to Amsterdam, or London, or Lisbon, or Sevilla, or Madrid, and then having them processed into finished goods and sold back to your colonies. The most important, although underlooked, is timber. Much of the cause of deforestation, aside from our rapid growth and turning every forest into a farm or a mall, is to fund the massive source of power, which is the naval ship, without which there is no colonial economy. So if we look at the early colonies, and these are sort of the early charters, again, they go back in straight lines. Uh, they're usually gifted to one person, who then subdivides them out to charter companies. And all of these things become important. Now again, cigarettes don't exist until they discover tobacco. Heroin doesn't exist until they discover opium, which you guys talked about already. Coffee, no. Tea, no. Tomato sauce, no. All of these things are products, the things that we eat and consume every day, 
of the colonial encounter. <coughs> All designed to feed the British Empire. So Virginia was primarily concerned with tobacco and the growing of tobacco for basically feeding an addiction. It's important to understand how much of the world is transformed for an addiction to sugar, caffeine, or tobacco, or narcotics. Right. Now most slave owners were actually pretty small. They rarely had more than five or ten. The massive large plantations extraordinary extraordinary well. The population of the Americas was about 50% slave, 30% servant, 20% free white man and white, at least initially. Here is an index of the amount of slaves captured on a nightly militia. You can see numbers in the hundreds. These are not people who took this lightly. So there were a lot of resources extended. This is Thomas Jefferson's advertisement for a runaway mulatto slave called Sandy. And of course, his index of slaves that he sold. He was an extraordinarily wealthy British landowner. You've got to remember, the founders of the revolution, particularly from the South, were basically British aristocrats who were, had left England to serve better periods, who wanted to take over land and basically rule as the British aristocrats did in England. What pissed them off is they weren't treated as the aristocrats. They weren't part of the House of Lords. That's what taxation without representation means. Had they been invited to the House of Lords, there would have been no revolution. Getting down to the architectural scale, Jefferson was a massive fan of Palladio, who sort of pioneered the use of classicism for domestic buildings. Here he's copying uh, Palladio's famous Villa Rotunda for a crude drawing. He fancies it himself an architect. Palladio exists when Venice is now um, surpassed by the Ottoman Empire. And the Venetians retreat from the trading world and have to return to farming. And he's basically the master at giving these gentlemen farmers what they want by sort of publishing one of the earliest treatises on how to treat antique classical architecture in a modern way. And what he basically does is he says you concentrate the most of your wealth in the center for prestige, and then the working parts of the farm are attached and left a little low. And so here you can see that here. This is the Villa Canaro. Palladio also manipulates the classical system. The Greeks and the Romans would have never used this for a residence. It was sacred architecture for the gods. So what Palladio does is give license to use these materials for all purposes. And you've seen this in the colonial world already, where classicism is about virtue and about power, and not no longer about these stacks of facades. But you can see all the focus of the wealth is here. The rest of the building is simple. Jefferson was fascinated with Palladianism and the French. And so here, he, this is actually from his own collection. This is a drawing. And again, what you see is this sort of monumental front and then working parts distributed around. What happens to Palladianism when it enters the colonial space is the working parts are turned into the slave part. So here you can see, as he's experimenting with Monticello, basically doing a crude copy of Villa Canaro. Here he's using the Palladian diagram, and I could have used any number of buildings uh, from around uh, from Maryland South to do this diagram. You have the big house, you have the working parts. It's located at the highest point on the site, so you could see out. It's important to understand that what we see today is not what was found. It was in terrible condition, as was Mount Vernon. But it's also about a portrait of Jefferson itself. It was a very self-conscious effort to portray himself as a solitary philosopher, living alone, thinking, drawing, writing, right, speeches for liberty. And he sort of followed this very popular model of what's called classical emulation, where you hold up great heroes and great art and great things to prove that you are virtuous. So you walk into somebody's house, you see a good collection of painting, fine furniture, and this continues today, right? You display your wealth and prestige through the kind of car you drive or the suit you wear, right? Classicism in the 18th century becomes a way to rebel. Uh-oh. What just happened? Oh, it crashed again. Bummer. It's not power. No, PowerPoint's crashed. This is a brand new computer, and it's pissing me off. Like, literally four years old. Continue. Nope, I got it. I'm back.
There we are. Let's zoom in. Yeah, whatever. You gotta fl you gotta go with it. Do, do, do. Plantations and see, it's like a review. Lightning speed for the ADD generation. Think of it like a movie. Oh yeah, I've seen this before. It's like Groundhog Day. You should actually do that with lectures. The second time you see a movie or a show, you notice different things. You can always go back through. Brazil, mining, indigenous replaced, architecture, coffee, destruction, and the U.S. Here we go. And we are back. Emulation. The idea in classicism, ah, you're killing me. So skip the slide that triggers it. It's crashing. Yeah. Don't send. Cancel. All right, we're going to try this one more time. But do something different this time. OK. Skip over that slide. Maybe I'll just get rid of presenterville. I'll just do it from the slide view. I think it's a. I think it's presenter view. I think it's a slide. So go, um, do you, can you get the slides lined up? On the side, yeah. So, and just skip it. So scroll down and skip the one, one that's crashing. The one that crashes it. Yeah. Okay. It's because those red lines. No, it's this slide that's crashing. Oh yeah. That's an important slide. Skip it. All right, we're it's gonna go. I'll, I'll skip that one. That's the one that's crashing it. You think so? Yeah, All right, so we'll do side. this. Yeah. All right. I'll just explain it. I'll just do slideshow. Oh, see, it doesn't do it. Did you have it highlighted? Yeah, of course. Did. I hate PowerPoint. Yeah, let's do it this Welcome way. Welcome to the club. Maybe do a save video. Oh, I can do that. Oh, no, we don't have time for that. Sure we do. No. Take just two seconds. Try, try what you were about to try. All right. I think we should save it as a PDF. I can fly through the rest of it. They're usually right. I know they are, because they're, uh, they're more technical. Do that one. Just, uh, can you do it without your notes? Mm-hmm. Slideshow. So skip. No, oh, it doesn't work. It's not doing it. Do it, um, do mirroring. Oh, here we go, here we do go. Do mirroring. Nope. So do mirroring. The monitor. No, here, we're just going to do this. Because you're not using your notes, right? Mm-mm. That's a movie. This will be all right. Okay, now well, that's happening. Take a moment. Anyone have questions so far? What? How much time do I got left? I have a question. Sure. Uh, why was the Monticello not uh, What happens when all these people die is the U.S. doesn't really care about historical things. Most of the world, caring about historical objects doesn't happen until it's a modern phenomenon. When all of a sudden we start destroying them really rapidly and people have nostalgia, when St. Peter's is built, they take down the oldest building in Christendom, and nobody cares. When Mussolini bulldozes half of classical Rome, nobody cares. When Robert Moses guts New York, he calls it cancer, nobody cares. We only start caring very, very recently. It's a miracle anything survives. This idea that heritage is both a link to our past, nobody cares. Everyone wanted to move forward. It's only a modern phenomenon in the 20th century. Preservation is very much a modern phenomenon. The fact that anything survives is a miracle, considering how much we like to bulldoze and bomb things. 